everybody to our Zoominar series. Um, and um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the two speakers today uh, with the first one. One will be Dr. Wei uh, Peng, uh, and the second speaker is uh, Dr. Hamamstrom. Um, just to remind everybody, the format of uh, the seminaries will be uh, that each speaker will talk for about 30 minutes, followed by uh, about 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. Uh, and it, when the second uh, Q&A finishes, uh, both speakers uh, will be uh, in the panel uh, to answer all the questions um, from the audience. And, um, it is my pleasure to uh, first uh, introduce uh, Dr. Wei Feng, uh, who is a professor at the School of Biosciences at University of Cannes. Uh, he did PhD in physical chemistry with the dissertation advisor, Professor Sara Linze at Lund University in Sweden. And then Dr. Wei Feng uh, joined the laboratory of Professor Sheena Ratford at the Osbury Center for uh, structure and molecular biology at the University of Leeds uh, to study the mechanism and the biological impact of amyloid assembly. And his current research uh, interests include uh, supramolecular protein assemblies, protein folding and misfolding, amyloid and peons, and he applies um, FM imaging uh, for his uh, studies. And I don't want to take any more of your time, so glad to see you again and to have you at our Zoominar uh, series. And now you can share your um, okay. talk with us. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing this. I'll try to share my screen now uh, with uh, uh, the slides. Hopefully you guys can see, or oh, start in the middle. <laughs> um, there we go. I hope you guys can see my yes. screen. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, in, it's in all presentation. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. everything is perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you all for tuning to uh, this uh, Zoom in our series. So today um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, structural biology of amyloid, actually. So the title is Polymorphic, uh, Polymorphic Landscape of Amyloid Assembly revealed by AFM, so that's atomic force microscopy and the individual particle structure reconstruction. So, so, uh, so today, hopefully, I will talk a little bit about the work we are doing in my lab, uh, trying to understand um, uh, the structural basis of amyloid polymorphism, as well as uh, the biological impact by mapping uh, the uh, landscape of, of amyloid uh, structures. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, my funders and all the people that have uh, had the pleasure to work with uh, in, the, uh, in the last uh, decade, really. And uh, the people on the line are the ones, uh, the work that I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. And uh, so, first of all, a little bit introduction about amyloid. I guess I don't really need to um, convince uh, this audience uh, why studying amyloid is um, uh, important and meaningful. Uh, so amyloid, so these are fibrilla structures, um, so protein structures, uh, and uh, they are uh, about uh, 10 nanometers in width and could be um, several micrometers long. So one nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So these guys are really, can be considered to be nanoparticles in fact. Um, and uh, amyloid is, uh, they are some of the amyloid uh, structures, they are involved in human disease, such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So of course, uh, it's incredibly relevant in today's society for us to un really understand how they are involved uh, in disease. And there's also a sub um, group of amyloid uh, called prions. Go. So, um, Prions, uh, so they, uh, just like amyloid, they are uh, fibrilla structures, but they can spread between uh, cells, between 
uh, even uh, I mean between individuals and even sometimes between species. For example, uh, we've heard mad cow disease uh, uh, in the 80s. For example, in the UK there was an outbreak. Uh, but more importantly, amyloid, uh, they are not all disease associated because some of uh, some amyloid structures, they are involved in important biological uh, processes. Uh, so it's really a variety of different things uh, they are associated with both disease as well as biological function. Um, and uh, of course, in terms of why I originally went into amyloid research is actually looking at disease associated amyloid and uh, it's uh, uh, there's uh, actually a quite large group of human disease that's uh, amyloid associated and amongst them uh, we have uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease such, such as uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, and uh, Parkinson's disease. So the assembly of amyloid structures from their protein uh, monomers, so the, the precursors uh, to amyloid, th this process is incredibly complex. And over the last uh, uh, one a decade or two decades, uh, we've uh, really uh, understood a lot more about amyloid assembly. So our community uh, so ha uh, really have uh, 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 started to understand uh, both the, the kinetic mechanisms as well as the structures uh, that uh, you can call amyloid. Um, and one of the important aspects is if you have one type of pre precursor amyloid uh, that can form amyloid, it can actually form a lot of different amyloid structures. So uh, in this uh, schematic, it's represented by fibrils that look different. They have different twists, different width, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is really um, making understanding amyloid structures really difficult because, you know, which are the structures that uh, are relevant uh, for disease, for biology, you know, and uh, how can we form one structure and not another structure? And, you know, so there are a lot of different questions. And it's very hard to study uh, samples that are heterogeneous. Uh, so if you have a sample, you have so many different structures in there, uh, it's it making understanding the structure study it's very hard. So in the last few years, uh, there is something called uh, the resolution revolution in the cryo-EM community. Uh, so cryo electron, uh, cryogenic electron microscopy. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, push to study amyloid structures. So here we wrote actually, uh, my lab wrote a review about uh, the structures we have uh, deposited in the electron, uh, electron microscopy data bank and for amyloid. And as you can see, it's almost exponential uh, growth uh, in amount of information about amyloid structures. And the, inform the resolution of these uh, um, structural data is also getting better and better. Uh, and of course, we wrote the review last year and it's already uh, you know, in 2021, right? 2022, it's uh, it's already very much outdated because there's so many new structures uh, being uh, you know deposited uh, in EMDB, uh, and they they just it's still growing exponentially. I think so. In the review, we really looked at you know, back then. Uh, I think March 2021, all the uh, major amyloid structures, but now it's. Uh, yeah, there, there's just so many of them. It's uh, very hard to get an overview. But what's striking to see all these structures is, for example, here I have a page uh, of the big figure we have on alpha cyanuclein and now tau. And you can see even with the same alpha cyanuclein sequence, you can form so many different types of structures. So here we're looking at the fibrils uh, cross section. So you imagine the filament goes into your screen, the cross sections, they look so different. Uh, and we're talking about uh, all of these, uh, this group here, these are formed by alpha cyanuclein, for example. It's the same protein sequence, and yet they form so many different structures. Uh, so, so th this is really, really uh, a big question, you know, how they are formed and uh, which are the structures that's relevant for understanding their association with disease, for example. So what we uh, looked uh, back then is all of all the structures we're trying to kind of uh, make it more systematic understanding what kind of polymorphism can exist so um it's really we found it's really hierarchical uh in the sense that for example you can have uh, amino acid sequence difference in point mutations uh and you can have differences in the protofilament fold 
can form uh, fibro different fibro assemblies by having different number of filaments and so on and so forth. And you have mesoscopic, so that's nanometer to micrometer uh, length scale differences. For example, how twisted they are, you know, how the, their length distributions, you know. So there are a lot of different things that can uh, change between one polymorph to another polymorph. So uh, then, what's uh, what's important is really understand uh, their association with uh, with uh, biology, with the uh, disease, for example. So uh, over the years, I've been studying amyloid. One of the key questions that I'm the key things that I'm thinking about is that even if you have the same structure, you know, just if they have the size difference, uh, these structures can behave differently in biological setting. Uh, and of course, on top of that, we also have a structural difference, really uh, important structure difference. Uh, so you have different surfaces, you have different cores. So, uh, so that the really overarching question is, you know, with the same cross beta core structure, so cross beta is basically the core of amyloid, that's how they're defined. Uh, some amyloid disease associated, uh, they can be toxic or even transmissible, for example, the prions that I talk about. But others are inert and tolerated in, uh, you know, uh, in uh, in biology. So why? So, uh, and uh, I've been looking at um, uh, the the individuality of uh, the particles in a population. So, um, so for example, in a po amyloid population, amyloid fibrils, uh, they can have different size, and then they can have different polymorph distributions. And these, some of these uh, properties are micrometer to nanometer. So it's not just how the atoms are arranged in the uh, filament. It's also, if you look outwards a little bit, uh, how the filaments, um, you know, arrange, uh, protofilaments are around, uh, arranged around each other and so on and so forth. Even when the atom inside core is the same, the outside might still be the, uh, not be the same. And how these sort of things relate to, uh, you know, how they are toxic, uh, how they interact with the membranes. Uh, maybe how transmissible they are, uh, whether they are uh, easy to fragment, so to divide, um, and whether, you know, one type of polymorph structure is more uh, important than other uh, structures. Uh, and all of these are important questions. So for today, so this is a bit of introduction, but today I'm going to um, focus on the polymorphism aspect because uh, we have very complex uh, protein structure system where you have samples, a population with a lot of different structures. So the key question today is how we're going to study polymorphism. You know, uh, is it enough to study one or a few uh, key structures, or do we need to look at how they're distributed? So uh, I'm trying to convince you that actually we need to look at how they are distributed, and uh, we're going to have to uh, map how they are distributed and identify key species within that map. So, so today's, that's the today's topic. Um, and uh, to do that, uh, so I'm just going to give you kind of a preview of what I'm trying to convince you about, that we have uh, a free energy landscape uh, that looks like this. So you have one well where you have the, the monomeric protein, and then they can jump into many, many different wells. Uh, so each of these will be one type of amino structure, for example. So if you imagine looking at this type of well from above, uh, a topographic map is what I'm trying to say. Of course, uh, then the question is, what kind of parameters do you, uh, do you have to study and so on and so forth? But let's worry about that later. So I'm just kind of trying to give you a conceptual idea of what map, what kind of map I'm talking about. How do you map this sort of thing? So if you imagine these as little uh, valleys and you look from above, so this is how uh, the map is going to look like. Okay, so this is type of map we can kind of generate. And the second question is you have these uh, little uh, wells. So, so they are basically individual structures. How can we identify these structures in the maps? So basically, how can we draw the map and how can we identify the key locations in the map and refer them to actual species? So those are the two things uh, that uh, hopefully I can convince you that we can, uh, we can try to do. Uh, <clears throat> And to do that, uh, we use uh, a method that we use a lot in, in my lab. So that's atomic force microscopy. So I'm just going to introduce you a little bit uh, about AFM, which I think is really, really uh, cool uh, kind of a tool for structural biology that may be often overlooked. And it's highly complementary to cryo-EM. I'm a really big fan of cryo-EM. 
uh, the resolution revolution is amazing, but I think AFM can really contribute a lot complementary information to the to the structure information you can get from Cryo EM. So, um, so the key um, uh, feature of AFM that we're gonna uh, be taking advantage of uh, for uh, studying amyloid is really the high signal to noise. Um, because if you have high signal to noise imaging, essentially every single image that you see, if you have one observation of one fibril, one particle, then you have actually quite a lot of uh, structural information about that particular particle. So you can look at really rare species and you can look at individual particles. So look at their individuality. Uh, so it's, um, it's a type of scanning, uh, scanning probe microscopy. So the, the predecessor is the scanning tunneling microscope. And then the uh, inventors uh, came from IBM and they got the Nobel Prize about the same time as the original Nobel Prize for Physics. So that's in 1986. Um, and that's uh, really, it's almost 40 years ago, isn't it? And um, so it's capable of detecting features smaller than one nanometer. Uh, so because the vertical resolution, uh, so if you look, uh, thinking about X, Y, Z coordinates, the Z coordinates of, of uh, um, amyloid, uh, of amyloid, for example, so basically made by AFM. So the Z coordinates for each of these points, they can be sub angstrom. Um, but the XY resolution is uh, in the order of uh, tens of angstrom, so it's a nanometer resolution. So it's a bit uh, different in the sense that the, of the three spatial dimensions, you have different uh, resolution, uh, which is kind of special for compared to other methods. Um, and uh, as the name implies, what we are detecting is the tiny force uh, that uh, you get when you have uh, when you touch your sample surface with a very sharp probe. So these are really, really um, nanometer size probes. Uh, so at the tip, you might just have few atoms. Um, and the tiny force we're talking about, they are in piconewton range. And just for comparison, uh, the rapture force of a carbon covalent bond is uh, basically thousands of piconewtons. And uh, the rupture force of uh, hydrogen bond is about four piconewtons. So for AFM, uh, the really, really uh, good ones, uh, we are now talking about single digit piconewtons, you know. So, so we are talking about really, really fine uh, force detection. And we'll, uh, with that new force curve based methods, you can actually control how much force you're putting on your sample. Uh, and you, that way you can generate actually really nice high signal to noise images uh, where you can really each observation of our particle is literally all you need to know to nanometer resolution, how much, uh, you know, the structural properties uh, that you are interested in. Uh, with the AFM in our lab, uh, we looked at a lot of different uh, things. For example, uh, we looked at how um, the dimensions uh, relate to cytotoxicity. So this uh, you can look up on these uh, uh, papers that um, I've published, uh, both uh, myself and uh, other people in you know uh, in my lab as a postdoc, as well as when I have my own lab. So. Uh, and we also look at uh, fibril fragmentation, uh, so that's the division of fibrils. So all of these applications, or I should also say that last year we also looked at surface um, nucleation, so that's uh, surface properties we're interested in, uh, which I think is very important going forward uh, in amyloid research. So for all of these, we use AFM to really look at both uh, the structure and the, uh, the size, the sort of dimensions, and we are talking about already uh, roughly speaking, we are characterizing individuality of the fibrils. So we're not looking at uh, you know large group of them. We really count individuals, and we look at individuals as well. Um, but uh, for a couple of years, we've been working on this three D reconstruction of. Uh, uh, um, uh, twisted helical filaments such as amyloid filaments and we're talking about individual reconstruction so if you have one AFM image like what I said uh, it can be really high signal to noise uh, if you control the forces and stuff like that and each observation you can reconstruct a three-dimensional uh, kind of a um, surface envelope of that uh, uh, filament that you, you see on image uh, so there's no 
cross particle averaging. So we haven't uh, averaged uh, many, many different particles. We're really looking at the local structural features, okay? Uh, local to that particular filament, but even within the filament, local to the, uh, the, the uh, single twist, essentially. Um, and um, we actually uh, uh, done this uh, as a test first on uh, peptide uh, amyloid uh, fibrils, so short peptide that can form amyloid fibrils. And as you can see here, uh, I'm just showing you an example that uh, we can make a model and then we can then simulate how the AFM image is going to look like and compare. And we can really see that they, uh, you know, you, you can generate a model that uh, can give you AFM image that just look like the data, essentially. And with this approach, uh, uh, all of a sudden, from a you know a high topology image, you can get uh, three-dimensional information, and you can measure things like cross-sectional uh, area, cross-sectional geometries, uh, and so on and so forth that you otherwise cannot uh, you know. And how do we do that? We basically uh, doing something called um, contact point deconvolution. So basically, we can calculate where the contact point between the tip uh, of the probe and the sample is based on the image. And then we can then take that into account and then we can back calculate uh, what the sample surface uh, like. So I'm gonna go straight forward a little bit. And by doing this, in fact, what you realize is if you have a kind of a uh, circular cross section or a spherical particles, your contact points actually come narrower than the image uh, would otherwise uh, would make you believe. So there is actually uh, a magnification uh, of uh, your fibrils, which kind of we take for granted, really. Uh, and we can achieve slightly higher spatial resolution if you take that effect into account. And then we can generate um, a contact uh, deconvoluted coordinates. And then using that, we can get a lot more accurate structure information from the original image data without losing information uh, compared to older methods for deconvolution. Uh, but this is all very technical. I'm showing you also that you can look at uh, the uh, in Fourier space. So if you do two dimensional Fourier transform, you can compare the pattern you get uh, from the data compared to the simulation. And you can select uh, a, uh, a model that more uh, resembles that of the data. So that's another method uh, approach that we use. Um, how, uh, like what I said, we kind of first applied it onto model uh, amyloid uh, fibrils formed by peptides, and we really done the individual uh, reconstruction on all the fibrils that we can actually see on the images, uh, each one by itself, essentially. And uh, so we've done uh, really hundreds of models uh, because each one is one observation, right? So. Uh, and then we just really compare their structures. And then I show you all of them, uh, or for example here, uh, all the data, the kind of a, just a snapshot, just to see how you know, individual these fibrils are. And then we also made models. So these are all individual models as well. Each one corresponds to one observation. So how are, we get, how are we gonna make sense of what we're seeing? Because uh, remember what I said in the beginning, the aim is to be able to map uh, polymorphism. So we're gonna put this, these things into a map. So to do that, we measured structure properties from these models, for example, uh, width-related parameters, twist-related parameters, and uh, cross-sectional area-related parameters. And we plotted them, uh, for example, on a 2D plot with um, direction of periodic frequencies that's related to the twist frequency. And, uh, and also the value, if it's negative, it's left-handed twisted. If right-handed twisted, you've got positive values. And then the average height widths, which is a width-related parameter. And all of a sudden, you see different patterns for different uh, populations. Uh, and this is exactly what we want to achieve, right? So we can, we can really map out what kind of structure features you can get in that population one filament at a time, and we just build up the map by doing that. Uh, you can measure a lot of different parameters. So uh, when I'm giving you a two-dimensional representation, it's actually a, a projection. So you, you actually, uh, these maps are multidimensional. So they're actually quite complex. So visualization is still kind of uh, something that we work on. But for simplicity, uh, because it's really hard to visualize something that's high dimensions, so we tend to reduce it to two dimensions and show you this type of graph. 
uh, but uh, we can also cluster these. So clustering happens at all dimensions, but it's hard to visualize again. So we can show you on two dimensions how the clusters are. So when I say cluster, it's basically looking at fibrils that's really, really closely related structurally to another fibril. So we cluster them together. And to do that, uh, you know, we just use, you know, the type of uh, clustering uh, that you, you might have uh, similar to the, the, the ones that you, you can analyze multiple sequence alignment and stuff like that. It's the same idea, uh, but from a 3D structure point of view. Uh, and by doing that, we actually found that there are a lot of different clusters that's more likely a uh, sort of bigger cluster than others. And from these uh, tree diagrams, you can already see that some populations, they're more heterogeneous because you have further distance uh, between uh, the different uh, you know, clusters. Uh, so that's the Y axis. So you can quantify the heterogeneity uh, of your sample, as well as uh, look at how many different clusters, significant clusters you have. Okay, so this is about building the map. How are we gonna uh, be able to identify the spots that you see on the map? So this is a, a recent uh, publication uh, uh, that we've done in, in early 2022 to show you how to, you can integrate a cryo EM data with AFM uh, information. So with this, we uh, just uh, for showing the principle, we use uh, a tile sequence. So in this case, the DGAE uh, filaments uh, that uh, Basically, uh, we work together with uh, uh, Professor Louise Serbo in the University of Sussex. So we work together on this, and it's her favorite sequence. Um, why is it her favorite sequence? Is because uh, we think that this uh, tau 297 to 391, they form core that's uh, very similar or identical to what you see uh, in pair helical uh, filaments that you can see in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so we uh, generated uh, fibrils, so we imaged them, and we can see uh, on the images some areas where you have really nice single filaments that are looking like this, and we can do the 3D reconstruction like what I just told you about. Um, but how do we know what kind of core uh, these uh, uh, you know, filaments got? So to do that, what we did is we digged up all the available tau structures, because tau is highly polymorph uh, polymorphic, you can form a lot of different structures. Uh, even from the same group of sequences. So we dig in the EMDB, so electron uh, microscopy uh, data bank, we dig out all the tau amyloid structures and we simulated how the amyloid fibrils would look like on AFM image and we compared it to the actual AFM image data. And from here, you can already see that some filaments, they just don't look anything like the ones we observe, while others, for example, the one from CT type two, and uh, the pair helical filaments for AD, they actually look quite uh, much alike uh, the, the, the AFM uh, image data. So we quantified this difference. Uh, so uh, there's another uh, thing, another type of things that you can quantify. So those are the uh, structural parameters that I talked about, you know, the handedness, the crossover distance, and so on and so forth, and the cross, uh, cross sectional area, and so on and so forth. We all also quantified the difference between our observed 3D uh, uh, you know, structure based on our 3D reconstruction with the three-dimensional maps from the cryo EM for all of these uh, polymorphs. Uh, so here is a video of, uh, showing you how we uh, basically compare, uh, made the 3D uh, models from AFM and compare them. So I hope the video works. There we go. Oh, I scrolled past it. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, here we go. So basically we can isolate uh, each individual observations of filaments and we can straighten them uh, digitally. And then we can perform the 3D reconstruction and make uh, the, uh, the 3D surface envelope models that we, uh, uh, that we can do on every single observation. And notice these models, even the twist, they, they are not even because there is natural structural variation within the filament that we preserve. And from these uh, cross sections, we can actually fit in uh, the, um, uh, the model from the cryo EM data. Uh, and by doing this, we can compare, we can compare how likely something uh, looks like, uh, you know, the, the, data, the image data that we look at, as well as the 3D, uh, 3D structures that we can reconstruct. 
And we score these differences. Uh, and basically on the x-axis, the image similarity. So this is one we simulated uh, the 2D images and compared it with the image data. And on the y-axis, it's combined that uh, difference with also the comparison of the three-dimensional uh, models between the cryo -EM and the AFM data. So if you look at both uh, similarity uh, scores, then we can rank them. And uh, the number one rank is actually PHF. Uh, so and Luis, uh, my collaborator Luis, was very happy, obviously, because we did this. We did really rigorously quantify everything. and. Uh, indeed, uh, as we thought, PH, uh, the, the filaments that we saw were most likely going to be PHF uh, structures. And we were really happy also when we discussed this with um, uh, Shores Group in Cambridge, uh, because they were also working on the cryo-EM of the sequences. And uh, shortly thereafter, they published their findings in, in life and uh, to show that these tau structures really can form uh, basically fibrils that has the same structure as the perihelical filaments from Alzheimer's brains, essentially. So we were really pleased that it was kind of a validation for us. Okay, so this is basically the story of why we can map a polymorphism and we can identify what kind of structures we have in each of these spots. Uh, and uh, just to show you a little bit of the unpublished data, we are now working on uh, mapping uh, the polymorphism of uh, amyloid beta-42 fibrils, so fibrils formed by AB42, which is associated with Alzheimer's disease. And in our lab, if you do it, uh, a sample uh, made by these monomers uh, done recombinantly, you actually get really, really heterogeneous uh, fibrils. You get a wide range of different polymorphs. And we are on uh, course to basically map uh, how the different spots uh, are populated, as well as comparing which spot correspond to um, different uh, published uh, AB.42 or AB in general um, structures on the uh, data bank. So, uh, so this is hopefully going to come out very soon uh, because we're really excited that this is really a mapping exercise. And then we're linking the polymorphism and the structures within these maps into really disease relevant structures is what we're doing. Uh, okay, just to summarize. Uh, so I'm basically uh, today presented uh, with you some uh, developments that we've done uh, to understand amyloid polymorphism, which is really important aspect um, in order for us to understand why some, um, some amyloid are disease associated, others are not, and then really try to understand how many, uh, you know, what kind of structures we can actually form from a single sequence, and also from of these structures, which are the ones that are important for, in this case, uh, for disease associated amyloid, which one are found in disease essentially. So to accomplish that, I've kind of uh, presented to you the um, uh, the developments we've done in my lab in terms of uh, 3D reconstruction of individual filaments using AFM data, so AFM topographical data, we can use that to reconstruct 3D uh, surface envelope models. And uh, the key thing, take home message here is we can do that one single observation equals one model because, uh, uh, because we have really high signal to noise, um, the inherent AFM physics gives you high signal to noise images. Uh, so we don't need to average across um, a lot of, uh, in this case, thousands, tens of thousands of particles. And I also showed you that uh, we cannot do, uh, we cannot map uh, amyloid polymorphs and quantify how heterogeneous uh, these populations actually are. So we are looking at the populations, uh, one filament at a time, but together, the whole population, how heterogeneous. And I've showed you that you can actually identify groups of these uh, individual filaments when they're grouped tightly together. So they're uh, maybe a cluster of similar structures. They are, we can show that we can identify these structures by comparing AFM data with EM data. So this is kind of an integrating uh, structural information from both methods in this case. Uh, and with that, uh, so thanks founders and uh, the people that I've worked with again. Uh, and uh, so thank you guys for listening. And uh, as you can say, I'm, as you can tell, I'm really, really excited about the prospect of doing this. And we are currently finishing a few more manuscripts and uh, we're also hoping to share the image analysis tools uh, 
sometime this year, really. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me. Um, thank you for listening and uh, happy to discuss uh, whatever questions you might have. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much. It was such a great talk and such a great idea to look into the polymorphism. It's a very challenging task. So, um, so well, uh, we already start having questions. So um, uh, I'll read it for you. It's coming from Lee. Uh, and uh, the question is, says two technical questions. And number one, is it possible to reconstruct very short filaments? For example, some filaments are shorter than the half pitch of the twist. This happens a lot to tissue derived fibers. And there is question number two, how much uh, would the fuzzy code contribute to IFM imaging and reconstructions? Uh, okay, I didn't quite uh, hear the second question, but I can answer the first question. Basically, I'll how repeat short, it. Yeah, I'll yeah, repeat it. How short filaments uh, you can do? So, uh, in our data sets, uh, sometimes uh, in some uh, samples, uh, it's a long published stuff, but we actually also see really short filaments. The shortest you can do. Uh, you have to have basically one full twist uh, because uh, with the AFM, you only see the top. So we basically infer uh, the um, basically a helical symmetry onto the filaments. So we can only do twisted filaments uh, if you want to have the whole filament. Having said that, part of the algorithm is about deconvolution. So the deconvolution uh, you can do with any kind of structure. It doesn't have to be a helical, doesn't have to be uh, long, uh, but doing that, you only get the top surface, uh, not the bottom surface, because the bottom oh. surface uh, we get by looking at uh, the twist, really. So you get some structure information uh, on the really short ones, but not uh, not enough to make a full reconstruction, I would say. Uh, so you can still measure some stuff, um, even if you have non-twisted uh, filaments, but uh, it's not as good as say, if you have full twists. Uh, I don't know if that uh, makes any sense. Yep, thank you. Um, the second question that I'm repeating it is, how mm -hmm. much would the fuzzy code contribute yeah. to the AFM imaging reconstruction? It's a, an excellent question, and it's actually um, something that we are um, or kind of uh, trying to look at by looking at the cross-sectional. So I don't have a good answer to this. Uh, I think it varies between different uh, filaments, different systems. Uh, and at the moment, I can see that we just like, so for AFM, you would imagine that uh, it's more volume based, right? So uh, basically, uh, you can, um, you, you, when you have a cross section and the cross section looks slightly different than the cross section of cry EM, then you can imagine that maybe you have something to do with the fuzzy code and stuff like that. But in reality, the, the, at least the system we looked at, the difference is actually really small. So you can actually uh, get a really good on exactly the same. Uh, sample between cry EM and AFM, you actually get really nice fit of the core. So which means uh, that uh, somehow the surface um, is uh, basically when you, when you probe it with the AFM tip, you actually, uh, you know, uh, wave uh, kind of a, a, you know, you don't have the, the solid interaction like what you have in the core, which means then the images you're getting, they report more on the core than on the fuzzy code. Uh, so, so this is, uh, I mean, I don't have any hard data or quantification to show you, but this is kind of my feeling. So why that is the case, I think it really depends on the flexibility, uh, you know, on different things that you have on the surface. Uh, so, um, so this is, uh, you know, the, it's something that, uh, I think, uh, will be very interesting to look at, uh, simply by, uh, if you have enough number of, uh, fibro structures and enough number of individual, Kind of a, a reconstruction so we can compare the cross sections and by doing that i hope uh, to at least get a feel of how much um, involvement the the you know the flexible surface really matters for afm imaging um so moving to the the second sets of questions everybody mm -hmm. likes to ask more than one question yeah uh, so there are three sub questions and i'm going to read them one by one okay it's coming from um uh uh Jean Ming Wu 
uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, the question number one is, so will the morphology of amyloid fibrils be concentration dependent? It's an excellent question. I don't have the answer. I suspect uh, that uh, um, in some cases it will. It depends on the concentration range as well. So, I mean, uh, the, the thing is that we, uh, Simply, we cannot do everything in my lab, right? So, so the aim for me is really try to uh, give you some of the tools so you can try it out on your own systems and try different concentration and so on and so forth in the future. So hopefully as a community, this is kind of like, uh, um, I think something that we, we all can do, I think. Um, so I think it's really interesting. So I, I'm just uh, telling you what I think. Um, my, my gut feeling is, yes, it might change a little bit depending on the precise systems. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I don't think it, that it will be very concentration um, dependent. So because uh, think things like alpha synuclein, uh, they will be much more sensitive to other stuff in the solution, uh, which means those will be, uh, you know, uh, more um, have more influence on the population distribution, uh, the distribution, the polymorph distribution. <coughs> uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm thank, sorry. Yeah, I think I think you. I'm not answering the question. I'm kind of a uh, I'm kind of trying to uh, encourage people to you know try to do the mapping a bit more too. So <laughs> kind of like uh, I think this is uh, really has to be a community effort because uh, it, mm. at the moment it is a lot of work to you know you have to have hundreds of uh, observations and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a fair. Uh, uh, so the the next uh, the question number two and three they are actually quite similar. So I'm going to uh, read them to you. Um, uh, the first the number two actually will there be big differences in fibromorphology between in vitro and in vivo uh, fibrils uh, by AFM? And then the question number three, what are the main factors that influence the different morphology of the same fibrils between in vitro and in vivo? So this is kind yeah. of going back. Yeah, okay. So this is also uh, kind of a question that everybody in our community really uh, care about, right? Because, uh, so my lab uh, mainly study uh, recombinant stuff. And then the question we always get is, you know, are you studying the right species? Uh, that's, uh, are you studying things that's disease relevant? If it's, uh, if it's A beta or if it's tau, you know? Uh, and uh, so my answer to that is, up, so can recombinant proteins form in vitro uh, the same uh, disease relevant structure. So my answer is absolutely yes. But have uh, in the past, have they been uh, reported? So the, then the answer might not be because uh, I think because, because uh, amyloid is highly polymorphic. So that already told you, you know, the, the, the assembly landscape is really, uh, you know, rugged and at the same level. So you can form a lot of different structures uh, even with tiny amount of difference in the environment. Right. So, and therefore, absolutely, if, if the structure can form some, uh, if you have a sequence that can form a certain structuring disease, then in vitro, you should also be able to do that if you can find the exactly precise uh, environmental factor that makes that structure, you know, appear in disease, right? And that's what is lacking, I think. Uh, because, uh, because it's sensitive, that means finding that precise, uh, you know, environmental factor or the environmental condition it's gonna be hard because if you just tiny bit off, you might be uh, ending up in completely different well. Uh, so, uh, so that's the challenge. And with the tau story that I told you guys about, about the, the DGAE tau. So in this case, uh, with the AFM, we really identified that they did form uh, in vitro the same structure as uh, you know as um, you know AD. Uh, AD tau uh, paired fil uh, uh, filaments and uh, and uh, and that's from AFM data and th this is also being seen with the uh, cryo EM data. So so those two you know methods together absolutely told you you know uh, it's possible. You you just have to have the right sequence in under the right conditions and if you can find that then uh, you're definitely gonna get uh, uh, something that you can have in the brains. Uh, and finding that condition might tell you a lot about the biology behind the disease as well. So I, I think it's really uh, an important thing to look into, you know, if you have the same sequence that you think is involved, 
what other conditions uh, are you need? Is it like, uh, is it a solution condition or is there some kind of cofactor? You know, the, these are important uh, things, uh, you know, to consider, I think. Yeah, so uh, I, I hope, yeah. uh, did I answer part of the question at least? Uh, what's the second part? <laughs> um... Okay, let, let's move to the other question okay, because okay, we are yeah. kind of running short of time. Yeah, sorry, uh, yes. And, and um, I, because there are so many questions which are coming, um, I'll just uh, let you uh, like um, answer them um, after okay. uh, the second seminar. So, uh, and uh, there will be one more question um, here coming. Um, uh, which uh, I'm trying to be fair to everybody, read them in order. Uh, okay, this is from Sophie. Uh, thanks, uh, Wei Feng, for a lovely presentation. Have you done any reconstructions of fibrils seeded with human or mouse brain samples? Uh, we haven't we we haven't done a seed at once, but uh, one of the things we're trying to do is obviously ho getting hold of uh, uh, disease relevant samples. So all I can say is at the moment is uh, we are trying to do that. Yes, but um, at the moment there's uh, uh, there's no data that I can show. Uh, but I think uh, it's definitely something that's uh, that's all all, all on on our radar because it will be really really exciting so uh, to really uh, show that uh, you know there's a population a polymorphic population distribution in uh, disease relevant structures yeah yeah so yeah watch so, so yeah. yeah yeah so uh yeah if you can please stay uh and uh for everybody who um mm -hmm. uh put their questions and their questions were unanswered, uh, please yeah. stay for after the seminar or you may listen it on YouTube if you don't have time uh, to hear the answers. Uh, so um, with that, we will be uh, moving to our uh, next uh, speaker, Do Dr. Hamstrom um, uh, is a professor in uh, protein chemistry at uh, uh, Linköping University, Sweden, and uh, Dr. Hans Strom uh, received his PhD in biochemistry at uh, uh, Linköping University, Sweden, the same university he's here, and uh, with the situation advisor, Uno uh, Carlson. Uh, Dr. Hammerstrom did his postdoc uh, studies in the lab of uh, Jeff Kelly at Scripps La Hoyer. Uh, this is in the United States. And while at Scripps, he studied the mechanisms behind protein destabilization and work on developing kinetic stabilizers of uh, transtire team. Uh, he has been awarded uh, the Goran. Uh, Good uh, Staffson Prize, uh, the Tagge Erlander Award, and the Swedberg uh, Prize by the Swedish uh, <clears throat> Royal Academy of Sciences. And uh, Dr. Hammerstrom, uh, current research interests are protein folding, molecular chaperone function, misfolding, and amyloid formation in various systems and organisms. And I don't want to uh, still more of your time. Uh, welcome to our Zoomino series and um, thank you for coming and for your time. And if you can please upload your slides, it would be great. Thank you very much, Magda. And thank you, Rams and all the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to speak to this great forum. I think I'm sharing the right presentation. Am I, Magda? Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah. good. Thank perfect. you. So I, I think it was excellent uh, setup that Wei Feng was right before me. He ended on A-beta and I will talk about that, uh, but with completely different uh, approaches than what he's doing. So I found conformational polymorphism to be very appealing when I studied protein folding because in folding we learned that one sequence generates one fold and we get one function. And these states are, you know, you can unfold the protein, you can refold the protein, and then you can actually crystallize many of them when they are nicely uh, globular and soluble proteins. And then with the misfolding, with the prion strains and all that strangeness that, that appeared, I was very appealed by understanding how can actually this 
um, multiple of polymorphic structures form. The question is how many do they form? And I completely agree with Wei Feng. I think they are quite many. And that they also self-replicate makes it even more uh, exciting, I would say. And, and what we're trying to do is to work in many different systems at different resolutions. So we do a lot of in vitro work where we have opportunities to go down in high resolution. Uh, and then we also look in, in transgenic flies, we look in transgenic mice, and we look in human samples and try to sort of understand how is polymorphism associated with disease? Like this sort of question, what structures are relevant for disease? And, and, and yeah, I think most structures are relevant relevant for disease the question is you know which ones should we target for certain diagnostics and therapeutics and this is true for a beta and tau i will only talk on a beta today mm -hmm. uh, and and i think it follows nicely from the previous presentation we have these amazing uh, structure models that have come out for many labs uh, of a beta a beta 42 and a beta 40 certainly can form very, very different structures uh, uh, when it comes to the folding of the constituent polypeptide chain. The, the C terminus can be hidden inside uh, the fibril or they can be exposed on the surface. Uh, and, and they assemble often in these timers. Uh, and and uh, sometimes you also see these trimeric structures, or at least that's what people think happens when, when a beta 44 forms certain types of polymorphs. But there's another aspect about this, which also Wei Feng touched upon, and, and, and that's you know what you find in in vivo. These fibrils are for the most part uh, in vitro generated material. And, and the fantastic work from, from Saul Chires and Michel Godert have prepared and purified fibrils or, 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 or filaments from human brains. And they've also seen that there are at least two types of A-beta polymorphs, folding polymorphs in the human brain. Uh, I think that there are many, many more, uh, but these are certainly very prevalent since they find them in quite a number of, of different human samples. And one additional aspect about this folding polymorph is that, that you also get this assembly polymorph. I think, I think Wei Feng, uh, touched upon this in his hierarchical model. So if you take fibrils and put them on an EM grid, you all very often see a big difference like we, we saw from, from his beautiful AFM work, that you have different twists and you have multiple filaments within the same uh, sample as you can get. Here we have two filaments, here we have five filaments, twist is certainly different. Here we have two filaments and two filaments, one have a wide twist and one has a tight twist, but they're all formed from a very pure sample of the same A beta peptide. But it doesn't have to be folding polymorphism that explains this, but you can take the same structure and assemble it in the, in the computer and make a filament. And this filament can pack and make a dimeric filament, either face to face or back to back. And certainly these will have very different polymorphisms. And if you make a trimer, it will certainly be different as well. And the surface chemistry of these will be very different, both at the ends and on the surface of the fibers. And as we know, structure and function is intimately linked when it comes to proteins. So it's very likely that they have different properties when it comes to toxicity, spreading, resistance toward degradation, and so on. So how can we try to translate between samples that we make in the test tube or purify from different organisms or see what's actually present in the tissue. And what we uh, are trying to do is to translate these pure systems towards what we see in, not in living organism, but fresh frozen material. So it's as sort of native structures as possible. And our favorite method to use for these kinds of studies is to use uh, fluorescent probes, which are amyloid specific. And our favorite probes 
uh, are called luminescent conjugated oligothiophenes, or we can also call them the Peter Nielsen probes because it originates from, from his work in his lab. Uh, and they are oligothiophenes in that they are conjugated together by small five-membered rings called thiophenes. And they bind for model structures. Uh, this is a HETES uh, fiber model structure from, from Beat Myers group and together with Adriana Guzzi, they could map the Congo red binding site onto this uh, HETES fiber. And we know that the thiophenes, which looks like this in the molecular structure compared to Congo red, uh, bind to the same binding site, at least on these model structures. But the difference between Congo red, which is a great dye, I will come back to, to Congo red and analogs thereof, is that the thiophenes have a flexible backbone, so they can snake into these binding sites and really have high affinity. And they adjust their structure or the conformation of the probe adjusts to the binding pocket, uh, making them very high affinity. And also that we can use fluorescence spectroscopy to see that there are different structures because the optical properties of the probe change when they have different conformations. So that's not enough uh, because sometimes it's very hard to get, get spectral resolution to be good enough. So what, what, what Sophie uh, in my group did uh, a number of years ago was to use oligothiophenes of two different uh, types and co-stain uh, mouse brains, fresh mouse brains that uh, came from uh, collaborator Matthias Jucker uh, and increase the contrast of this LCO staining to, to look at fibrin structure over time in aging mice. So this is a, a section of a mouse and this is an amyloid plaque. And this section through here is just a, a heat map where we can take out uh, emission spectra. And in a mouse, which is fairly young, 12 months old, only HFDA, this long red fluorophore, binds to the plaque. There's very little binding of this probe, which is called the QFDA, which has four rings. When the mouse aged six months, the plaques have obviously grown. But on top of growing, uh, the optical properties of the plaque change when we stain them with these two, two probes. And you see that the core of the plaque here has binding in the blue region where this uh, QFDA molecule binds, but the periphery still only stains with HFDA. And the HFDA also stains the core, but there's, there's much more of the QFDA there. So the, the plaque uh, evolved or matured over time. So very interesting, what, what Sophie did was she also took a beta pure in the test tube and did staining over time on the hours time scale instead of the months time scale here. And so that in the early phases of fiber formation, only HFDA, HFDA bound. Uh, and the ratio here of QFDA binding increased after a number of hours, which was concomitant with the formation of these bundled fibrils. They were few, more solitary fibrils at early time points. And at later time points, these bundled fibrils appeared which, you know, from a polymorphic point of view, looks different from what you see in the early time points. Uh, suggesting to us that what we're looking at here is a different structure of the A-beta amyloid compared to what we see at early time points. So what about human disease? So Matthias Jucker uh, took Sophie's method and moved towards human brains and, and scanned through quite a number of, of Alzheimer's disease patient brains, fre uh, freshly frozen from different regions of the brain, from a number of, of uh, Alzheimer's disease cases. Uh, most of them were from sporadic AD and a few were from familial cases. Also, as, as Sophie did, looking at the core of the plaque. And what we see here is that this core has a different color than this core, but they're quite close in space uh, and mapping many, many of these cores, one can make a Cartesian plot of HFDA intensity here and QFDA intensity on the y-axis and see that the sporadic Alzheimer's disease case of the cores of these plaques are quite heterogeneous. They're all over the place. In some of the familial cases, it's more clustered. 
so for example, this Mexican mutation, present limitation is, is more QFDA positive. And this present limitation is more clustered along the X axis where it's HFDA positive. So apparently this polymorph properties forming essentially clouds of structures, at least from the point of view of looking at fluorescent staining, definitely seems to have relevance for looking at different disease types of Alzheimer's disease. We also collaborated with Yiri Safar and Yiri Safar had a, had a different interesting cohort of patients that he was looking at. And that was all sporadic Alzheimer's disease cases. That would be sort of the orange triangle distribution here, but they have very different disease progression. So these are uh, sporadic AD, but one is called rapidly progressing Alzheimer's disease. And the other one is called slowly progressing Alzheimer's disease. So the disease duration was approximately a year or slightly more, or like eight years, which is more of a normal type of Alzheimer's disease progression. Also looking in the frontal, occipital, and temporal cortex. And this is the QFDAA, HFDAA ratio on the y-axis, as uh, was in the previous plot. And it's obvious from this comparison that the rapidly progressing Alzheimer's disease has fewer uh, mature plaques. That we have QFDA is less, and it's higher in the uh, slowly progressing cases. And this sort of mature and immature uh, nomenclature that we use here comes from, from the paper I was referring to about looking at mouse ages, whether it's at 18 months and older, that's where we start to see this, this uh, QFDA fluorescence from the core of the plaques, which was not present early ages. What's also is interesting from, from, from this, even though there are very few cases, I shouldn't make, make super big conclusions about this study, uh, is that the QFDA positivity in the frontal cortex is very high for the uh, slowly progressing Alzheimer's case and it's low for the rapidly progressing. But if you go into other areas of the brain, it appears that uh, in rapidly progressing Alzheimer's, the, there are more mature plaques in the temporal lobe, sort of progressing down towards the frontal lobe. But it's opposite for the slowly progressing disease where you have more immature plaques in the temporal going through the occipital towards the frontal, suggesting that the pathology pathway, if there's a spreading pathway in the brain in these patients, which many people believe uh, is the way these diseases progress, it will be the reverse order, at least from these three areas, from these few <clears throat> patients. It can also certainly be like what, what, what Wei Feng was referring to, there can also be different replicating local environments that, that would suggest that we get this type of polymorphic differences between different disease types but it suggests that disease progression and structure polymorphism is connected, which is very interesting. So what I've shown you so far and what we have, you know, our, our favorite probes are the Nielsen probes that we really like to use, uh, but it could also be that, that what we're seeing there is, is, a, is a probe specific type of, of phenomenon. But I'm, uh, I think it's, it's a protein structure phenomenon. That's at least what we have a lot of reason to believe, but we can also look with other probes and see if we see similar things. And uh, from a, a pathology perspective, Congo red is the gold standard for amyloid. That's sort of a definition that something should be called amyloid. So what uh, uh, William Klunk and, and Chet Mathis did was that they made fluorescent analogs of Congo red. Uh, uh, which they also have used for many other types of imaging modalities. And, and, and these this trans steel bean molecules, for example, X34, is actually a very nice fluorescence amyloid probe. So we've made uh, uh, analogs of these and, and see what we can observe from, from other probes than, than the conjugated thiophenes. And Yun Sang, uh, PhD, a former PhD uh, in the group, synthesized a number of, of these analogs, which are, which are called uh, benzothiodiazoles, and they are environment sensitive. And when we stain an amyloid plaque for an, for an aged HP23 mouse, 
uh, taking pictures with hyperspectral microscopy. You can take uh, you can image this uh, and, and pseudo color it so we can show the, the spectra uh, reflects the emission intensity, the emission spectra from, from the, uh, the same probes of one probe on a plaque. And you can see that the, the periphery of the plaque is red shifted. And that's why you see this orange. And it has a longer emission wavelength compared to the core, which is blue shifted uh, by approximately 25 nanometers, showing that the chemical environment sensed by this probe is different in the core compared to the periphery. So it's not only an LCO or double staining <clears throat> phenomenon. You actually see it from, from, from other probes as well. We can also go back to, to try to make monomorphic amyloid fibers. And this is something which uh, my fame was also referring to. It's quite complicated, but, but the, we're, tr we're doing our best. And, and uh, uh, PhD student, uh, Johan is working a lot on, on, on making such fibers. So if we make fibers in uh, neutral pH equals buffer, pH 7.5, it can be trees or it can be a phosphate uh, cell line buffer. We see uh, fibrils in the negative stain EM, which appears to be multifilamentous and they also have a high tendency to aggregate. We can also image them with cryo-electron microscopy so we don't have any potential artifacts from the uranyl staining. And they have the same type of morphology. We haven't solved the structures, but luckily there are structural models from very similar conditions mm. that, uh, from different labs, both from uh, Sara's lab and, and from, from Rolandrik's lab. Uh, and uh, if you make fibrils from the same sequence under completely different conditions, what we call the Griemer fibrils, uh, acetonitrile, uh, acidic with TFA have completely different structures. Uh, that you see on the EM is much more monomorphic and they are separated, they don't cluster like this. Uh, same with cryo-EM. And we presume that we are replicating the structures that uh, uh, the uh, Grimer published in science. If we use X34, so this is what Ganesh Mohita in the lab uh, found. He, he is using X34 and X34 is not very uh, environment sensitive when it comes to Stokes shift, but X34 appears to be very sensitive for uh, uh, imaging with fluorescence lifetime imaging. So these will be the native condition fibrils in P7.5 aqueous buffer. They have a long lifetime as you can see on this color map, but the fibrils formed under acetonitrile conditions have a much shorter lifetime. And we can quantify these doing, or Ganesh can do analysis with different lifetime components in, in the confocal microscope. And the longer lifetimes appear to cluster completely differently compared to the, to the acetonitrile denaturing conditions fibers. So the structures are different, X34 binds to both of them, uh, and, and they have different structures. So what do we see if we use X34 on a human or a mouse sample? So if we image uh, plaques from human cases with X34 flame imaging, or we, Ganesh is doing this, <clears throat> we see that we see a, a distribution of lifetimes within the same range as what we made out from these two individual uh, uh, fiber preparations in vitro. It's slightly less uh, variations if we look in CAA. That's also very interesting, vascular amyloid from A-beta. Uh, there is variations from patient to patient. The mouse data is actually even more uh, spread out compared to what you see in, in humans, uh, going from very short lifetimes to quite long lifetimes. And it's also perhaps age dependent, even though these mice are, are quite similar age. But this is an overview mapping a plaque, uh, the totality of of, of plaque structures taking different regions of interest and assembling them together in one two-dimensional plot here. So what, what Ganesh uh, really tries to emphasize now with, with his recent findings about this method is that, is that there are many, many layers in, in plaques. This is from the APP23 mouse, that you have a core, you have a ring structure, 
and there is a periphery that he, uh, the, he refers as the corona, which is really the outer rim of the plaque here. And they're quite significantly different in lifetime. And that's why we get this, this uh, color code here. And he resembles this to, a, the, he calls it the Kiwi model, which I find very appealing, that it's, it has a core, it has a ring, and then it has a, a corona, uh, if, if you slice a Kiwi in two. And that's the way plaques look like if you make a, made a cross section through this, suggesting that the probe binds in a different chemical environment that will uh, give you different lifetimes and hence will have different structures. So we use fluorescence lifetime imaging, previously we used uh, hyperspectral imaging to reveal as a sort of a surrogate marker for amyloid polymorphs. But there are many, many more aspects about amyloids than, than you know, finding that they are polymorphic. We want to, of course, everybody wants to understand what's toxic, what's, what's killing neurons and which polymorphs actually efficiently spread. Some are probably very inert and might not have too much implications for disease. And what we're trying to do is to, to map neurotoxicity in flies because they are very sensitive to uh, A beta. If you express them in neurons, we're trying to use the mouse as a model system to do uh, seeding and see spreading throughout the brain. And also uh, looking in the test tube to see if we can do seeding experiments and, and, and quantify efficiency. So in the flies, uh, what's very interesting is that if we have uh, two different lines of flies. One expresses the A beta 42 in glial cells, or one expresses the A beta 42 in neuronal cells. They make approximately the same amount of A beta. One uh, of these preps, or preps, one of these uh, lines, show that A beta is severely neurotoxic. The lifespan is completely, uh, I wouldn't say completely abolished, but it's cut by 70% and the activity by even more, so they're very uh, affected flies. If we express in glial cells, <clears throat> the toxicity is much less profound. What's interesting is that the A-beta amyloid, which is the green here, is stained by one of these LCOs, uh, is, is confined to the interior of the, of the cells, the, the, the nuclei are colored in red, and it looks more like a cloudy type of structure compared to amyloid beta 42 expressed in glial cells. They're extracellular because they're, they're away from the, uh, from the cells here and they're very thick and fibrous and look quite bundled in the fluorescence microscope. And as one would perhaps expect, if we do the QFHF staining, we see that the glial cells have a more mature type of, of staining pattern compared to the neuronal. Uh, expressing, showing that uh, toxicity is probably to some extent linked to the structure of the amyloid uh, uh, protein. We can also use the fluorescent methods to, to compare mice with mice and as we did with flies with flies and we can then also compare flies with mice. Uh, going into this translational aspect of using the same type of fluorescent staining and uh, hyperspectral microscopy in this case. So this is, uh, is work by Fariana. She's working on a lot of different mouse models to look at uh, how their, uh, how their uh, plaque structures look like uh, in comparison with each other, both genotype and age. What's interesting here is that We've looked at this before, they have mature uh, fibril cores in APP23 mice. In, in Per Nilsson's mice, uh, which is a knock-in model showing a neurodegeneration, it's called APP NLGF mice. Their uh, uh, LCO profiling shows a much lower uh, QFDA binding compared to what we see in APP23 mice. And interestingly enough, these mice show uh, some aspect of neurodegeneration that you don't see uh, as profoundly in AP23 mice, mimicking 
what we see also in, in flies, that the neuronal expressors are more severely affected compared to the glial cells, suggesting that we see similar patterns. This is a very busy slide. I will, I will uh, uh, not go through everything. Uh, this is also a work by Fariana. So she's not only looking in mouse and, and fly brains, she's also uh, uh, looking at seeding activity. What kind of structures form and what are most efficient in propagating new fibrils? So if we look on the top row, this is uh, purely in vitro experiments. So the substrate is A-beta-40 or the substrate is A-beta-42. Uh, and the gray uh, uh, lines here are the spontaneous conversion without seeding. If A-beta-40 is seeded with amyloid fibers of A-beta-40 that has only been incubated for seven hours, they're sort of in the, in the, in the lag phase here, they have very low seeding activity which likely stems from the fact that A beta 40 hasn't really fibrillated yet, so you don't have too much seeds to begin with. So the efficiency is very low. If she takes the 24 hour fibrils, which have been incubated in the previous experiment uh, beyond the lag phase, it has very high seeding activity. If you look on A beta 42, same experiment, early fibrils, where A beta 42 has formed spontaneous fibrils, shows high seeding activity compared to fibrils which have been incubated for 24 hours, where the fibrils presumably have matured and clogged up, they have lower activity for seeding. So you have less, uh, you have less uh, fragments and more probably clustered fibrils. If we can make a mix of A beta 42 and 40, as the substrate. It's actually in our hands, at least, very hard to see this with fibrils made uh, either seven or 24 hours. If on the other hand, the original seed that we have out here, which have been amplified in vitro and then has been seeded in different reactions, but if the actual origin of these fibers comes from glial cells of Drosophila, neurons of Drosophila, AP23 mice or NLGF mice, they're quite efficient, comparatively efficient in seeding the mixture of A-beta-40, A-beta-42, compared to what we see with pure component fibers. So there is something, maybe templating effect that happens when the origins comes from, from an animal in vivo situation. So uh, I'm not gonna show, because uh, we haven't finished those, that work yet, what we're, what we're using, all these kinds of sort of origins of, of, of seeds for is to do then go back and replicate seeding potential in vivo by recipient AP23 mice. And this is a, a method that, that Matthias Jucker has really profoundly perfected, I would say, in, in, in the field. He was a pioneer in this. But <clears throat> what we started out doing, and that's uh, slides I will show here, is that if we just take pure recombinant A beta fibers, We've all learned that these are very uh, poor at seeding in vivo, uh, AP23 mice. So what Matthias Jukers uh, did was to take young mice, this is uh, what we're doing as well, what Sophie is doing in the lab, uh, take young mice, inject them with recombinant fibrils, wait for six months, sacrifice the mice and look at their brains. If the seeds come from A beta 40, this is a full section of, of uh, of a mouse brain, or half a mouse brain. At the age of nine months, they have small amounts of, of, of plaques. They're right on the edge forming uh, spontaneously more plaques. So it's very poor seeding activity of A beta 40. If we take fibers from the mixture of A beta 40 and 42, which are co fibrillated, there might be slightly more plaques and they might look quite different compared to what you see in the spontaneous or A beta 40 induced mice. What was quite interesting to us is that if we take A beta 42 fibers, which are uh, harvested right after the growth phase of the fiber formation reaction, their activity in seeding AP23 mice is quite profound. So this is a, a brain section. Here you see the hippocampus in blue. This is counterstained with DAPI. Uh, 
There are plaques, uh, parenchymal plaques close to the hippocampus and the corpus callosum up here, which we often see in prion infected mice are completely full of, of plaques. And there's very profound CAA. And CAA in these mice usually appear much, much later than at nine months. So, so the activity of, of, of these fibers are actually quite impressive, I would say. And these images are all uh, collected by Fariana. And I think it's uh, very exciting, actually, that we can, that we can uh, do this experiment. It's very similar to, to uh, making a synthetic prion, if you want. So I'm going to round up with, with just a few uh, reflections and uh, some work done by Johan Larsson in the group. So the question. Uh, that came from to, to Wei Feng was also about, you know, why are in vivo material different from what we see in vitro? And I think that's true. And I think Wei Feng is absolutely correct that we can replicate what's going on in vitro, but we're also making many different structures. So I, what I like, uh, I'll, I'll take up two, you know, uh, interesting ideas about this. And one I think is, is the proteolytic selection hypothesis that uh, Marcus Fendrich has uh, presented in that the only uh, amyloids, so the seeds that will prevail in vivo are amyloids which can withstand degradation. Of course, if you degrade a protein, it will escape and hence it can't seed. And maybe only those proteolytically resistant materials will prevail and hence we get a specific type of environment for replication. The other, uh, interesting uh, uh, new idea that, that comes from, from Johan's work in the group is that maybe we also have endogenous cofactor systems such as molecular chaperones that can direct uh, the assembly of certain polymorphs. So what Johan did was that he, he studied human and Drosophila and GROES HSP10, also known as GROES in bacteria, the cofactor for HSP60 or GROEL. And as one would expect, this is a beta 42 fibrillating in vitro. This is without, uh, the blue is without any chaperone, and the red is with a high amount of chaperone, and it delays family formation. The conversion rate at high concentrations of human HSP10 has been delayed. As expected from a chaperone, it would prevent aggregation. But what Johan found was that if you had a very small amount of human HSP10, the conversion time was actually faster. You see the green bar here. So Johan took even lower concentrations and uh, ran reactions. The blue, now we've changed the x-axis. The blue is now the spontaneous conversion. And all these are different concentrations of human HSP 10, 10 nanomolar, 5 nanomolar, 1 nanomolar, comparing it to 1% of preformed fibrillar seeds. And the conversion rate almost mimics the activity of seeding of ABR42, uh, which is very interesting. I think that, that you can accelerate fiber formation by the presence of a chaperone. We have a huge speculation about why this would be the case. Uh, HSP10 has, it's a, it's a homoheptamer. It has mobile loops that can presumably by uh, avidity bind to the ends of fibrils and maybe they can also stabilize uh, fibril conformers, seeds and, and accelerate fibril formation. And we're also thinking that this type of mechanism could influence uh, the polymorphs of the structures that form in, uh, also in vivo. And HSP10 is very much expressed in the brain compared to HSP60. So I encourage you to look at the paper. It was, uh, Wei Feng was the, was the editor of that uh, sp special edition. Okay, so I will sum up uh, with a few slides. What we use as our sort of Rosetta Stone or translational method to look at amyloid polymorphism in different complex tissues or in vitro and so on is to use fluorescent probes. And we can image them with intensity, different types of spectra analysis or fluorescence lifetime. And we see very big differences between different structures. 
And this and other things, of course, in the literature, because we're, we're a complete field, show that A, beta, and tau fibers show this vast conformation of polymorphism on many, many levels. But we don't know what it means. In our hands, at least from the model systems that we have looked at, it seems that hyper-stable hyper or very densely packed amyloid fibers seems to have less toxicity compared to thin and unstable fibers, presumably unstable, more accessible surface area. However, if they're too unstable, they would be degraded by this uh, proteolytic selection mechanism that, that, that uh, Michael Svendrich is, is uh, hypothesizing about. And I think that it's very important to try to understand the in vivo pathway on, on how polymorphs propagate, uh, depending on genotype, age, and exogenous factors. Otherwise, how can we design probes to, for example, do PET imaging and how can we know which type of structures we should treat and which structures we should leave alone? Uh, and I only have one more slide, if it's okay, which I, which I think is of very much relevance for this audience. So COVID-19 has really impacted the world for sure. And we're living the pandemic still to some extent, and especially people who have been affected by severe COVID-19 or <clears> suffering <throat> from something called long COVID. Uh, Sophie uh, in the group and myself have worked quite a bit on understanding what's the properties of the spike protein. And what we looked at the spike protein, we found that a number of segments within the spike protein are amyloidogenic, which is not too surprising because this is a massive protein. It has almost 1,300 amino acids per monomer. However, uh, some of these uh, segments can be liberated if we take, uh, or Sophie takes, neutrophil elastase and cleaves the spike protein in vitro. When I look at this under the electron microscope, we see that the spike protein forms very scary looking branched amyloid-like fibrils. Uh, and they're branched, which is <clears throat> surprising from an amyloid perspective. We don't know if this has implications for long COVID, but there are many people referring to brain fog. There is a study in the UK who shows that you have brain atrophy if you've suffered from COVID. Uh, and there are many, many uh, suggestions that there are vascular abnormalities in people suffering from COVID. And the spike protein, as everyone knows, is also a part of, of vaccines. And I think it's uh, very important that we actually address this situation in the possibility that the spike protein also from the vaccines could do bad things as in the case we see in the test tube. It's completely test tube experiments, but the epidemiology suggests that even though the side effects are very rare, it can have an implication for the safe, safety of uh, administrating dose upon dose and booster upon booster with these vaccines. And this is something which was also discussed in a nature uh, feature uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, which mainly is about microclotting and amyloidosis uh, of fibrin. So that's not a cherry note, but I think it's an important aspect with such a uh, interested audience to bring up. And uh, as you can see, uh, the paper we published in, in JAX in May this year has a, a profound interest from the readers. It's uh, the most read paper in JAX uh, the past year. And now I want to end, of course, thanking people in the group. Sorry, thank you people in the group. This is Sophie, this is Fariana, this is Johan, this is Ganesh, and this is Oliver. And I want to thank the funders, and I want to thank my collaborators in leadership and elsewhere that I've been referring to throughout the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fer. I really enjoyed your talk. It's really inspiring. and. Uh... It's, it's very much down the line of this puzzle of um, what to do to understand uh, fibro polymorphism. 
uh, we'll start having questions coming. Uh, and the first one is from uh, Patrick, nice talk pair. You mentioned that some of your dyes are sensitive to the environment. Do you know what aspect of the environment uh, they are most sensitive to? Charge, solvent, exposure, hydrophobicity. In the case, the one I showed here, the one I showed, uh, this one, what we've tested for this one is 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 a solvent environment, so essentially polarity, <clears throat> where you can replicate the same kind of shifts. If it's a very hydrophobic environment, that would be blue shifted. It would be the core. Uh, but that doesn't say that that's actually the reason why you see this in in in, in the plaques. What what Ganesh is working on now for X thirty four, since we don't have spectral differences really from this probe, but we have strong lifetime differences is to look at viscosity. So tumbling uh, of, uh, which is known for trans steel beans that they are sensitive to this, to try to replicate uh, what we see in the, in the different fiber types and what we see in the, in the plaques, in the yeah. Kiwi model. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, like going to the second question, uh, it's from Martin, a uh, great talk player. I was wondering what role you think uh, that a better deposited in uh, two Flavian negative diffusive uh, plagues, which make uh, uh, the majority of plagues in most AD brain uh, have compared to a better deposited in dense cord plagues. That's the first part of the question. So it's comparison. What the, what the role? What the, what the role is? What's that? Uh, the what the role you think that a better deposited? I I assume is the comparison between the a better deposited in two five in negative diffuse play, yeah. and compared to a better deposited in a dense core play. Yeah, I, I, I know that it's it's a very interesting question and I think nobody knows, but the diffuse plaques you, you find in people without cognitive decline, which are just old. And, and the core plaques are very disease specific uh, as a pathological hallmark in, in autopsy cases. So so it's a good question and, and it's sort of counterintuitive to what we see in the in the model systems. One would expect the diffuse material to be more toxic. Uh, I can't answer this, uh, really. Uh, mm -hmm. There's something uh, specific happening uh, with the structures formed in human brains. Uh, and uh, oh. we, see, we, we see the opposite in, in, in the flies, for example. Um, so uh, there's a second question. Also, are there any LCOs or other dyes that stain also a portion of such plagues. So do you know of any yeah. dyes which can stain the diffuse? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, whoever is asking this can can uh, talk to Peter Nielsen about that. He's working quite a lot on, on uh, the LCOs to, to find different amyloid structures also of A beta. But it's, you know, uh, not everything is stained by LCOs, but there are also different new types of molecules that he's making, which looks very promising. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think that we don't have any open questions and Wei Feng answered his questions. I have a couple more questions which I would like to ask you. Uh, and if anybody from the audience, please raise your hand, we can promote you to the panel or simply type in uh, your question. So uh, my question for you, Per, uh, I was not quite paying attention. You use so many different uh, fluorescent tags, but can you use uh, two fluorescent uh, labels at the same time? Um, have you perfected that uh, on the same tissue? So you're, yes. are you thinking that it, doing it? I mean, it, it can be done either when they are competing for the same binding site or when they are binding to two different binding sites. 
Congo, the Congo binding site is very different from Type 11 T binding site. Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, it's known for quite some time. And, and the PB binding site, the Pittsburgh compound B binding site, is a third type of binding site, which you almost only find in human brains. In certain human brains, because there are also human brains, which are very demented and they have a lot of A-beta, but they, have, they are PB negative, yeah. even though they are sporadic cases. Uh, so, so one can play with, with uh, different types of, of dice and really get nice information. And distinguishing what I think different polymorphs. Yeah, that, that was kind of my idea, yeah. trying to actually see that whether different regions have a different polymorph, a polymorph, so even the neighboring plaques, because it's yeah. kind of looked on some of your stainings that you might have variability. Uh, but but then it will be nice if, to kind of a second validator, if you wish, on the yeah. same tissue. Yeah, and we see that. I mean, if, if you take a human section, you can really see that they can come, they can become layered. If you use yeah. more than one dye, some are labeled, some are uh, with one dye, one is labeled with another dye, and some are labeled with both. And and my down these lines, my other question is about. Um, uh, the the plaques they're very you know they're very complex mi mixtures of things right you have a lot of other things which are going on and um can you speculate have you done in parallel i guess stain, stains with antibodies can you uh, um, speculate even uh, about the composition of, for example, the periphery versus the core of the plaques. You see this shift into fluorescent tags, but can you pin it to um, like a differences in the composition uh, in the core versus yeah. to the periphery? Uh, Have um, you of course, uh, yeah, yeah, but there are so many, there, there are so many. Uh, I know uh, it's difficult. Po possible but... other proteins and components like gags and and what have yeah. you, of course. But the nice thing is that you can replicate different staining properties also with pure systems in vitro, mm -hmm. suggesting that the sensitivity to, to the polymorphic structure is, is intrinsic to A beta or to tau, whatever you're looking at. But of course, you cannot rule out, we cannot explain why does this appear. And it appears in different mm -hmm. layers, uh, which can have certainly cofactor influence or truncations, post-translation modifications. Uh, and that's that's well known. We work with the, with a group in, in Gothenburg, uh, Jörg Handrider, looking at the population of different uh, truncations, for example, of A-beta, or the amount of 40, 42 within different plaque types. Yeah. So there's a lot yeah. of mapping to be done, I think. Oh yeah, yeah. So I think it's yeah, very important. You know, I think it was great. Way but, uh, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Fantastic work, and you can compare with yeah. you know, complexity of of, of of in vivo stuff, which is not purified from in vivo. I think that's also an important aspect about this. Yeah, I totally agree that uh, you know sometimes uh, if you purify, perhaps you're losing some of the key ingredients. Should we say? So yes. uh, and, and all these mapping will be great if uh, it's um, you know some kind of a multifactorial mapping. Yeah. Um, and you combine the information from your fluorescent dyes versus uh, you know the the, uh, the morphometric uh, features and so on yeah. and so forth. And I, and I think this is sort of where the field is moving in a sense, mm. but it's very hard. As you also refer to, it's very hard to do everything yourself, and you yeah. collaborate with some here, you collaborate with some here, but then to get this complete picture is, is yeah. a th synthesis hard to make. Absolutely. But yeah. but I think the field is moving in that direction, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah, because at the end of the day, we want to know what, what is exactly going on in this uh, the the plaques and tangles. Yeah. I guess. But whether they're toxic, that's a, a different. Yeah, topic yeah. I mean, I mean, this is this so is. I, I think I this, yeah. this is really. I mean, what we, what we find in a fly, you know, might have nothing to do with human disease, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It might yeah. be <laughs> something very. No, specific. no. But I, but I really, uh, I really do believe that it's very important to study the polymorphisms again, um, like and classify the the way you have been both going on. Uh, 
the different polymers because you can actually, if you wish, you can uh, look for commonalities and argue uh, like and target these commonalities. Um, if you wish for prevention or reversal, either way can be really great. So, yeah, and I think yeah, what we've seen so far when it comes to 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 treatment of these diseases has been very poor when it comes to cleaning out the plaques. Then usually it ends up in the CAA, or you have different kinds of vascular abnormalities uh, using antibodies in that case. But also the base inhibitors are not nothing is really panned out to be very good let's put it that way so maybe yeah. you know find people early treat them with something which is not so bad uh, that's the dream for everyone yeah 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 that's that's actually true um uh, i have a question about your uh covid fibro uh, mm -hmm. spike fibros. have you tried oh, to do if i may ask uh, if you if you try to do some uh uh, you know, more work on the uh, spike fibrils, uh, you know, from uh, amyloid point of view. Uh, these yeah, we're, yeah we're, we're, we're looking at different uh, uh, sequences. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to get a hold of these spike proteins. We have, it's very expensive to buy it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're looking into the Omicron uh, variant, of course, not the BA5 yet. We'll look at the BA1. And also with peptides that have mutations in the proximity of the amylogenic segments. So, uh, yes, uh, Sophie's working a lot on this, yeah, and, and yeah. it's it's very exciting. Even though it's also it's also kind of uh, you know strange uh, why we are vaccinating against the original Wuhan strain uh, yeah, when it's not present anymore since like one and a half years. Uh, but you know, but that's that's a different topic in a sense. I mean, we're looking we're, we're looking into to the fibers to form, and they're very interesting. I think that the, the peptide fibers that would be great to do AFM of. Yeah, because they're very structured, especially the the most amylogenic one. It okay. really is super nice. Yeah, you can send me some and I'll have a look. Yeah, that would be great <laughs> if you want. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 yeah. so so if we can present more, I think she can present at another seminar. Just talking about this topic, if she if she gets the invitation. <laughs> 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 well, uh, actually, the, I I just really want to wrap it up. I, I just so I don't keep calling you, but like speaking of viruses, there is this uh, the Spanish flu influenza also has been uh, connected to the onset of Parkinson's disease. I don't know if you are aware of yeah. that. Uh, simply because it's, uh, uh, as far as I understand, the one of the explanation is just uh, more fragmentation of the alpha synuclein into more amylogenic forms, so uh, proteolytic pro okay. processing of alpha synuclein, mm -hmm. uh, making this uh, shorter version, which is more amyloid forming. So, yeah. I think this is a, a field which has a lot we can learn a lot from from what's going on i think looking oh, yeah, at yeah, yeah, yeah. also previous pandemics and, and and the aftermath of those which yeah, hasn't so... really been addressed i think in the context of neurodegeneration or amyloidosis yeah yeah no i completely agree because uh, this is a big factor we are constantly bombarded by viruses all the time and yeah the yeah, yeah. big question is why do we get sporadic alzheimer's disease you know we actually don't know it doesn't affect everyone. It affects a large proportion of people above the age of 85, but not everyone. Well, that's actually true, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That might true. be an infectious agent or something triggering this. Yeah. yeah. It's just not genetic. It can be exogenous. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah.